Welcome to J-Life with Daniel. I'm your host, Rabbi Daniel Levine. Well, I'm here this morning with Rabbi Erica Ash, who is currently serving as the president of the CCAR, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, alongside running a wonderful congregation in Augusta, Maine. And in this podcast, we are going to talk about all things Jewish life, both small town and on the national stage. Rabbi Erica Ash, I'm so happy you're here with us. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. I'm so glad to get a chance to speak with you. Amazing. So let's start actually with just some uh, general biographical information. Um, Augusta, Maine is not usually thought of as a Jewish center in America. So how did you end up in the probably lovely place of Augusta, Maine and rabbiing there? It is lovely. Everyone is welcome to come visit. If you're in the area, let me know and I will say hi and give you a tour. Um, I actually, so I grew up in San Diego, California, so almost as geographically far away from Augusta, Maine as you can get. And I wound my way here with some stints in Ohio and Mississippi and Washington, D.C., and I really moved up here to take the job in the congregation at Augusta. My husband and I were living in Washington, D.C. We had three young kids, and we wanted a pace of life that was a little bit slower. I wanted a job that was a little bit more manageable um, so I could also spend time with them. And I looked at what was open, and this just seemed like a really good fit for me. And we've been here 10 years now. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Yeah. There's always yeah. been a soft spot in my heart for very small Jewish communities. I, I grew up in San Diego, which does have a fairly large Jewish community, but actually the Orthodox community there in my high school, my graduating class was actually five students in my senior class. Um, and it was yeah. always fascinating and really, I think, empowering experience of if you don't show up for something, the thing is not going to happen. Unlike when I lived in Israel or LA and no one will notice if you don't show up to synagogue for two, three months. So um, yeah, how would you describe Jewish life in Augusta, Maine before we get to sort of big picture stuff? Yeah, so I think what you said is really true. People notice when you show up and sometimes we'll have people call us and say, we're coming to visit the synagogue. What do we need to do? How do we introduce ourselves to you? And I said, everybody will know that you haven't been here before and they'll be very excited to see you. Um, So my congregation is a little over 100 households, and we serve a pretty big geographic area out to the coast and over to the mountains, so people drive quite a ways to come here. And like you said, it's really people have to roll up their sleeves and 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 help, right? You everybody knows that we need them to come so that we can make a minion uh, on Shabbat, right? Everybody knows that we need their help so we can cook uh, for Passover, so we can celebrate the holidays. And it's really, I really love it. I really love, I think there's a lot more investment, like you said, when you kind of know that your presence is really needed and matters and and people really invest in the community a lot. Yeah, I really love what you said about investment. And actually one of the things that I've been struggling with just personally, but also just, I mean, this could maybe take us into big picture American Jewish life is I think oftentimes the institutions that were built out in the 20th century very much sort of assume that people are anyway going to be showing up to Jewish events, say synagogue and Jewish learning opportunities and Hebrew school and other things like that. And so the institutions were built of once people are already going to show up because we know they are, what do they want as opposed to a different framework through some sort of commitment or even a covenant like relationship with the community of no, actually there won't be services on Shabbat morning unless you show up. And I think, I think that change is going to be really pivotal. So I I think that leads us great into the next question. As president of the CCAR, can you just give maybe a 20 second intro on what the CCAR is and does for listeners that aren't aware? Yeah, absolutely. So the CCAR stands for the Central Conference of American Rabbis. We are the rabbinic association for reform rabbis in North America and beyond. And our mission, we just actually redid our mission statement. So it's a little wonky, but I want to tell you what it is and then tell you why I think it's so important. We support and strengthen reform rabbis so that our members, their communities, and reform Jewish values thrive. So we're really focused on how can we help our members who then go out to serve the Jewish community? uh, How can we help them be the strongest and best rabbis that they can be? Amazing. And that's really incredible. And what would you say is the current state of, I mean, I know this is a very broad question, so we can narrow it down in a little bit, but how would you diagnose the state of reform movement in America? What are some of the positives you see, right? This is obviously a time of intense change, I think, for the entire Jewish world, vis-a-vis both what's happening in America and Israel. So 
how would you, you know, on the annual checkup of the reform movement in America, what would you, what would you give it? Yeah, so the reform movement, I'm I'm lucky enough to be the, the head of one of our legacy institutions, the others being the Union for Reform Judaism and um, Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, our seminary. So the three of us really partner together to serve the reform Jewish community uh, in North America and beyond. And um, I would I would say that I think, you know, speaking from the rabbinical side, which I know best, um, I'm really, really pleased and proud of, of the work that reform rabbis are doing. Um, you know, the pandemic, I think, was really difficult for, for everyone and particularly for rabbis who were really on the front lines in terms of figuring out how do we serve Jewish communities? How do we, like, I know how to use Zoom now, right? I didn't know how to do that and to run tech. Um, and I think the CCR provided such important support and uh, camaraderie and community to rabbis who were going through that so that we could serve our communities, um, that I feel like, you know, that state, the state of Reform Judaism is really strong. And I think another thing that's really interesting that we don't think about is that a third of our Reform rabbis are in organizational work of some kind. So often people think of rabbis as just serving in synagogues, but a third of our members are serving in nursing homes, as chaplains, as Hillel rabbis, um, in organizations, in day schools. So we really have a very diverse rabbinate. And I think that that makes our community of rabbis stronger to have people in all sorts of different work settings, uh, all sorts of different communities that we're interacting with to come together and, and really serve the reformed Jewish community, but serve all the Jews who are seeking liberal Judaism, pluralistic Judaism in some way that, that we're able to be there and, and to support Jews who want that type of Judaism in their lives. Yeah, you, you, I, I think you actually predicted the, the word I was about to use to introduce the next question. You mentioned pluralism, which oftentimes yeah. gets thrown around. I mean, I've long identified as a, a Jewish pluralist. I work for Hillel, which is, of course, a proudly pluralistic organization. Mm -hmm. It seemed like there might have been a time I could imagine in the mid to late 20th century where pluralism wasn't necessarily a, a derogatory word when used in explicitly denominational spaces, but it really seems like there's a shift going on where now people that are a part of different movements, I mean, I'm mainly talking outside the Orthodox world when yeah. I make this statement, but people outside the Orthodox world now talk almost proudly of pluralism as if it's sort of either a nod, and I'm curious to get your take on this, either a nod to the growing sociological reality that st strict denominationalism is sort of on the wane and melting down, or it's a sort of idealistic nod to the fact that okay, maybe at some time in the 18 and early to mid 1900s, it was important to have a reform and a conservative. And then in the 1920s to 1930s, a reconstructionist. And then in the late 20th century renewal, but now we're sort of anyway trending towards post-denominational. When, when you talk pluralism, is that more descriptive or normative? Meaning, are you happy that things are moving that way? Or is that mostly just an acknowledgement of the reality of what is becoming of American Jewish life? Yes, I think that's such an interesting question. And obviously I sit in a very particularistic role, right? As, as supporting reform rabbis. And I'll say that I think that this is something that Jewish life in Maine has really taught me. We have a fabulous conservative synagogue about half an hour away from us. Uh, Rabbi Rachel Isaacs runs that uh, that particular synagogue. And, and I love that there's a strong conservative congregation because if somebody comes to me and says, I want a full Korea, the full service, Musaf, like that is where my soul is, they are not going to be at home in my community, at least during davening, right? They, mm -hmm. That's really what they want. And if somebody comes to Rabbi Isaacs and says, where are all your nigunim and your, your spiritual poetry readings and your meditative services, that is also not something that, that their synagogue does well. Um, that's something we do well. So I think I think it's really important to have institutions that are that are within a denomination, right? That have that have a certain point of view and kind of way that they function in the world. And we also need to work together. So, for instance, through the Center for Small Town Jewish Life, the educator at uh, Beth Israel Congregation, the Conservative Synagogue, and I run a statewide Jewish teen program. Right. I don't have enough teens in my synagogue. They don't have enough teens in their synagogue. We want our teens to be able to be together. And that's an that's a place where we can all appreciate that the most important thing is that we're Jewish. And it doesn't really matter so much whether the kid is coming as reform or conservative or doesn't affiliate, identify as a denomination. We want to serve the Jewish youth of the state. 
Yeah, no, that's really incredible. And and even just to throw into the mix, this is sort of uh, out of left field, but I remember actually in the early 21st century, so maybe 15 years ago, there was a well-known Orthodox philanthropist. I'm forgetting the name now, but I'm sure listeners could could Google this. That was sort of, I don't want to say caught on a hot mic, but the, the whatever the equivalent was of uh, basically bemoaning the fact that much of the American Orthodox community spent a lot of the late 20th century maligning the other denominations. And mm-hmm. he was basically saying like, I wish we had had the foresight in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And of course, this is a very specific time in New York, you know, where it seemed like everyone was in competition. But he almost said, I wish we helped build up these other institutions as opposed to basically being uh, staunch staunch adversaries. And I I think it's definitely the direction that all the movements are are headed in. I I have this thought, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious to bounce this idea off of you, that it seems specifically with Reform Judaism and the history. And we've, we've done a couple episodes talking specifically about the movement. So I think hopefully listeners will be generally aware of the history. But really, in the early 1800s, at least the early reformists, who, of course, are very different than any reform rabbi you'd meet on the street in 2023, their sort of main sociological tension, if I had to be super reductive here, was how do we keep people Jewish in a time where the there are a lot of financial, economic, social pressures to basically become Christian slash secular. And the assumption was that people are are going to want to leave Judaism because there are all these social and economic pressures to basically have people leave the quote unquote shtetl and all of that. It seems almost as if the sociological pressures have switched now where it's not so much that if I'm thinking of your average high school student or your average Jewish college student, the pressures aren't so much that there's a strong either social or economic or really any sociological pressure against them joining a Jewish community. The default is sort of this, I hate to call it apathy, probably a better word is the you know 21st century American individualism of just you know, they're who they are. And, you know, why do they need commitment to this, you know, age old tradition? And it's not like, you know, unlike early reformists whose families and parents and grandparents were coming from, you know, shtetl life and, you know, very, very traditional, like I'm thinking, you know, Tavia from Fiddler on the Roof, right? There, a lot of their families are also coming from this sort of de facto 20th and 21st century American liberalism. And so the, the pressures of reform or what reform Judaism needs to do, I think their mission almost almost flipped 180. And I think that's really interesting. I I guess my question in the most general sense is, does that make any sense? It does. It does. Right. I think you're, you're really correct about, um, right. Um, right. Anti-Semitism and ghettos are very, very bad and they serve to keep the Jewish community Jewish because you don't have any other choices, right? So modernity gives people a choice to opt out, as you said, and, and that becomes something that people are concerned about. You know, I think I think something that's interesting um, for me, sitting where I sit, again in a in a small town Jewish community, where the kids that come to my religious school are usually the only Jewish kid in their school, or maybe their sibling is there, maybe there's right, is that is a very different kind of ethos that they're growing up with in than kids who are growing up in New York or Boston or other big cities where Judaism is just kind of around and they get there off for the high holidays. Everybody knows what Rosh Hashanah is, right? So I think that that in an interesting way, the, the minority experience that many Jews who live in small town America have actually draw them into the synagogue and the community a little bit more than, than perhaps if they're in bigger cities and opting out still feels Jewish. Right. You still feel Jewish if you're not necessarily going to synagogue because the kids who go to your school are Jewish and and those sorts of things are kind of in the air already. Yeah. And I, I love that sociological description of a lot of Jews just by by definition of being in a small town and maybe being the only Jew feel some sort of magnetic attraction to Jewish life. And I guess that gets to the next question. And listeners who will listen to the previous episode, um, I talked with my friend Rabbi Stanley Davids and we, we've known each other for years, so we, we're not shy in uh, sort of uh, openly discussing and debating as our listeners will uh, hear and hopefully have had a good time listening to. Um, but one of one of the things that I've really made one of my central questions, and I've been working now as a rabbi in the liberal world for, for the last seven years, is this question of, okay, 
people, congregants, high schoolers, college students show up to liberal Jewish spaces. And then the question is, then what? And mm. I think this is often a problem. And, and I'm totally a liberal when it comes to Judaism, politics, all of these things, as you know, listeners will know. But I think actually one of the problems that liberalism has of selling itself, and one of the reasons why I think in so many places, fundamentalism is, is on the rise, whether we're talking about politically, you know, in America or Israel, or whether we're talking about, you know, just in the American Jewish sociological spaces, is because if somebody is sure of things, and by sure, I mean, of course, with, you know, quotations, because nobody's yeah. actually sure of grand philosophic and theological questions. But if somebody's telling you, I know exactly what you need to do, exactly what God wants of you, exactly how to do it. And then us in the liberal space are saying, come, there's a hundred different ways to appreciate Judaism. There's 70 faces of the Torah. Yeah. You can have, you know, 50 different Shabbat experiences. Actually, I think psychologically they're there becomes sort of a, a choice paralysis when it comes to what yeah. a lot of liberal Jewish communities are are offering. And I don't I don't think it's a bad thing that we're offering all the choices, but I actually think for a lot of people, and I, I see this, you know, I don't want to mention any obviously specific organizations, but I see it on the ground playing out sociologically that a lot of people say, you know, and I'm just going to go to the one institution that gives me like the list of things of what I need to do to be a quote unquote good Jew. And you know, why do I need all this, you know, of Hillel and Shammai and, you know, different reasons. So um, I'm I'm curious just from both your small town experience, but also this sort of uh, purview of being responsible for, I think you, you mentioned 2,200 rabbis, which I'm sure that means at least 10,000 different opinions about how 100%. to run Jewish life. What are sort of some, you know, the, the, the spectrum of answers that you hear uh, offered to this question that I'm sure I'm not the only one that has? No, I think you're raising up something really interesting. And I think in some ways it is harder to be a liberal Jew, to be a reformed Jew than it is to be an Orthodox Jew, right? Because there is some like security and it's it's a little bit easier when you're told what to do and you do it. And it's much harder, as you said, when you have all this array of choices. And I I think that, you know, we, as you as you've mentioned, the reform movement has changed quite a bit in, in all of our history. And I, I think one of the things that I really love about our movement now and what our rabbis are doing is that I think we, we are providing a really rich Judaism to people out there. And, and I think that if you had asked people, I don't know, a few decades ago, many decades ago, what is reform Judaism? People might have said, oh, that's like the Judaism where people don't do anything, right? They don't, they don't. And I think that's completely... First of all, I have I have issues with that that description then. But speaking from now, that is that is not Reform Judaism at all. I think Reform Judaism and rabbis are providing a really rich and thick Judaism for people with meaningful holiday celebrations, with meaningful Shabbat practice, with really deep study. Right, the number I have in my tiny congregation, I have I think five people who are doing daf yomi. That's amazing right? They're like seriously studying the Talmud and we're almost halfway through. And um, and we now include Talmud study in our Saturday morning study because people want to study Talmud. So I think that, that the way to kind of respond to that choice paralysis is just to offer, to offer Judaism to people, not dumbed down Judaism, but real Judaism with all of the difficulties of the intricacies of text study and the way that the rituals happen. And I think people will opt into that. And they're able to opt into that. And I think this is really important for, for the communities we serve without having to deal with, how do I deal with my identity as part of the LGBTQ community? How do I deal with my identity as a woman, right? All of those things that can be a little difficult in Judaism around equality, um, that that is not something that we have to worry about in reform communities right reform rabbis are on the forefront of fighting for equality both in our communities where we live and so i think that that is a load off for people to say i can come i can be who i am and i can experience real real judaism and and study and learn yeah that's incredible about uh Dr. Yomi. and also it's funny i'm actually right. reading currently um Susanna Heschel's book on Abraham Geiger and all about, you know, his sort of philosophy. It's a fascinating book for um, listeners. It's, I'm forgetting the exact title, but I do know Jesus is in there somewhere. So it was very provocative. So when I saw it on the on the bookstore near my house, I was like, oh, I need to get this. You know, she's a great uh, scholar and just fascinating title. Um, but one of the points that really stands out is at least the early reform movement was 
anti might be a little bit too strong a word, but I'll, I'll say anti the Talmudic tra tradition in favor for more of a biblical type tradition. Yeah. And, and I think it really does speak to one of the ways that it's changing. Um, that said, I think there is, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed and, you know, listeners by now have heard, heard my biography, you know, many times, but coming from the Orthodox community to now the more liberal slash reform community is the things that I've, I think have been the most difficult for me to sociologically get used to, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, philosophically or ethically, is it does seem like specifically in the reform movement, there are, I'm thinking now like liturgy as an example, it seems like there are times where there have been theological choices made a priority instead of the like, you know, whole smorgasbord of like, okay, here is everything, you know, take the parts that are meaningful or not. And then oftentimes I feel like that, that does create a tension with, I mean, I think the greatest value of liberal Judaism is this idea of informed choice. Um, one, because I think it just speaks to Judaism throughout history. Too, because I'd argue even the Orthodox community is involved in informed choice as well. I don't think it's as you know black and white, you know, following Jewish law. But do you do you see a tension there between the sort of big picture reform institutions and liturgy with its you know sort of a priori decisions about what's going to be done, what's not going to be done, what we're going to emphasize? You know, let's say we're not going to do Musaf, but we are going to do this. That actually hurts people's ability to see the wide expanse of Jewish tradition? So I think that's a really interesting question, right? Something I actually didn't realize about the CCAR until I got into leadership, embarrassingly, is that we are also the publisher for the reform movement, right? So those prayer books that come out are done by CCAR Press, and you just said, by an editorial team that's making decisions about what's in and what's out. And I think it's true. If you want to complete Orthodox liturgy, you are not going to find it within a reform CDOR. And there are choices that are being made. That being said, I think that that there are there's a constant rethinking of what what is in and out, right? So I, it is there is a thoughtfulness around what we are including and not including, right? So the Giver wrote, as you probably know, has Metim and Hakol as mm -hmm. as both as options, right? So it preserves um it preserves that choice. And then other things like you said, Right, our our normal Shabbat prayer book, Mishkan Tefillah, and, and and festivals doesn't have a Musaf service. Um, interestingly, the Israeli progressive movement prayer book um, that they just came out with, their Tefillah Hadam, their new prayer book has a Musaf service in it. So I think that that's that's a really interesting thing to think about. So, look, it's not. I think you're right. There's not. It, we are not in our liturgy presenting the entire. Uh, possibility of what's happened. But I would also say prayer books have always been edited, right? right? I think sometimes we think that that the kind of art scroll that we pull off the shelf is the same thing that people were using 2000 years ago. And it absolutely I is. I thought Moshe wrote that. I don't know. He, you know totally, with, totally. With also all the, the tunes. Uh, yes. Yeah, with also the bad English commentary on the bottom, you know, that was also at a uh, Parsi and I know. So I think we're very much within the tradition of 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 Jewish communities that have thought about what parts of of the tefillah are essential to who we are as Jews and what parts are we going to are we going to take out or insert or add or change to make it relevant to our own life. So I see that very much as a part of the chain of Jewish tradition around around what goes in and out of that fixed book. Yeah. So let's switch gears, maybe go to an, an equally difficult question of, of anti-Semitism uh, when yeah. we First, first discussed doing this podcast was actually a couple of months ago, and it was sort of on the wake of the uh, Biden administration report that they put out about how to combat anti-Semitism. If any listeners are interested, you can go and read the 50, 60 page report, you know, a quick skim, you know, pause the podcast and come back. Um, I guess before going to the Biden report in general, just, you know, two things to throw out there for listeners. There's been obviously an, an uptick in anti-Semitism America wide for Orange County listeners, which I know are most of the listeners of this podcast, we have had a troubling increase actually just in the last few weeks here um, with actually one of my congregation that I have the honor in serving every couple of Shabbatot at Temple Beth Tikva actually getting swatted in a bomb threat that ended services in the middle two weeks ago. So of course, the listeners here are, are well aware of this stuff happening. Before getting to the specific Biden report to somebody who obviously has a much more bird's eye picture of what's happening in congregations across America much better than I do. What would you say is the general status report of anti-Semitism in 2023? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's certainly, as you said, there's, there's so many anecdotes like that. I think I'm so sorry that that happened to your community. 
Um, so many anecdotes like that from all corners of of the country, from from like you said, swatting to protesters being in front of synagogues and services. We just um, a few weeks ago had white nationalists in front of the state house, which is quite close to our synagogue, um, yelling at cars going by. Um, and talking about keeping the state of Maine white. So I, I think there is, right, the, the statistics bear this out and talking to rabbis that are serving every day, we're hearing that this is something that is that is cropping up more and more and has become more of a focus that they're needing to pull more of their attention to, 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 to what's happening in their communities. Yeah, and so specifically with the Biden administration, I actually, I, I don't I don't even know if if Trump ever put out a how to you know combating anti-Semitism report. Maybe maybe you know, but I guess how how has the Biden administration, what are they doing that's different, unique? What are sort of the main things that stand out to you about the report? Yeah, so um I think I'm not sure if the Trump administration put one out or not either. I don't I don't think so, but I'm not positive. Um you know, I think. So I think there's there's a few really important things about the report. One is the power of the president and the federal government just calling attention to this as an issue that needs to be addressed is incredibly important. So to have our elected leaders at the highest level say, this is something we're going to do, and for President Biden to be able to engage all of the arms of the federal government in this response are amazing. So if you look through the plan, you'll see this is what the Department of Agriculture is doing. This is what the Department of Education is doing, right? Things that you wouldn't, you might think Homeland Security would be involved, but you're probably not thinking the Department of Agriculture is, is you know, a bastion of fighting anti-Semitism. So I think it's really important that it comes from the top that this is something we need to think about and that all of our federal agencies are thinking about how can the work that we do understand the increase in anti-Semitism, how serious this problem is, and how, how we can combat it. And I think a big piece of it, you know, the first pillar of this plan is to increase awareness and understanding about anti-Semitism and to broaden the appreciation of American Jewish heritage. So I love that interplay of both having people recognize that this is a problem and it's serious and saying Judaism is not just a response to anti-Semitism, which I know you also feel very strongly about, right? It's not just about here's how we combat it. It's also things that we can do to appreciate Judaism and the richness of our tradition while also understanding the importance. And then, um, you know, I think another piece of this that's really important is the piece about improving safety and security for Jewish communities. I'm sure this happened in your synagogue. This is happening in my synagogue. Every synagogue, our security fees are going up, right? Every year we're paying more for police, for cameras, for all of that monitoring. Um, that's an incredible burden on our community and to be able to think about how the federal government and state and local governments can help us to remain safe and secure in our communities is really important. Yeah, and I think a couple, maybe a couple months ago, I spoke with uh, David Bacarsley, who in California is actually involved in a lot of that work. So uh, listeners should definitely go uh, scroll and find there. Not to um, highlight Trump as a, as a deep thinker, but one of one of the interesting, I think, differences, at least that that I've seen from what you just said, specifically in terms of American Jewish heritage, with I know a lot of what the Trump and the BB partnership administration sort of exuded was this idea that American Jewish identity is its own thing, and that American Jews, you know, it's not just we're all in the waiting room of about to move to Israel, which I think, sadly, it's certainly not my view. But I think, sadly, it is much of the Israeli public, certainly Bibi Netanyahu's view, and I think a little bit, you know, for worse, I, I think, was a lot of the Trump administration's view right. of the only thing you need to do to keep American Jews happy is, is Israel and, you know, not have to worry about, you know, the robust Jewish life in America. Um, I only use that as a segue because, you know, it's sort of always the, the elephant in the room. And I can't imagine at a CCAR conference where you have thousands of reform rabbis, you get any sort of consensus here, because I'm sure you have the entire spectrum of Israel from we are, you know, proud anti-Zionists wearing it on our shoulders, all the way to, you know, people that are first in line at the APAC conference and everything in the middle. I guess before even talking about anti-Semitism and anti-Israel and how that all fits in, how does the CCAR even, I mean, this is mostly just an administrative question. I mean, how do you do yeah. it? It's like such an incredible and impossible task to get anywhere on Israel when you have such diametrically, you know, diversity of views there. 
Yeah, I think it's a great question. And as you said, we have members who have a wide range of views on Israel. Um, and and I'll say the first thing that we do is we partner with our Israeli colleagues, our Maram rabbis. When we make public statements as the CCAR, we're always checking with the rabbis who are in Israel on the ground to say, does this right? Does this sound right to you? Is this what we should be saying and doing to help you in the struggle that you're facing in Israel? So having those connections is incredibly important and our support of those colleagues and their support of us. Um, you know, we just revitalized, we have a new um, Israel cabinet that we're working, that we just started um, in partnership with the URJ to think more about how do we talk as reform rabbis about this very difficult issue? And I think that we have the potential as reform rabbis to model for our congregations and communities what it is to have difficult conversations where we don't all agree. And we can have those in a way where we listen to and respect the other's opinion. And we've done that at a few conventions where we've really sat down and talked about, right, what is Israel? What does Israel mean to us? Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and, and I think that you know, we were, I was lucky enough to get installed in Israel. We go every seven, we go every year to Israel. Our chief executive leaves a trip, but our whole conference, our whole convention is in Israel every seventh year. And it was in Israel this February. And so in addition to being able to, right, be there and experience all that Israel has to offer, we were obviously there during the, the protests, which are ongoing. And to see the work that the Israel Movement for Reform and Progressive Judaism is doing in leading this and saying democracy is a Jewish value um, is incredibly important. And I think has really united reform rabbis in this country around an idea that we want to speak out to keep Israel as a democratic state. And I think that that's a place where, where we agree. And like I said, we wanna work with our Israeli partners to help make that happen. Sure. And then on the American side, when it comes to anti-Semitism, I mean, it's such yeah. a load. And I, I, I don't even like the way I'm about to phrase this question. So I'll, I apologize to you. But drawing the the line or the Venn diagram or whatever, you know, we want to call it of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, does the CCAR have sort of a central uh, approach there? I mean, there's obviously, of course, going to be the whole spectrum of opinion. But when it comes to American anti-Semitism and, you know, with the Biden report in general, it seems like the Biden administration has, you know, says sometimes, and here are some, some ways it could be here, some ways it's not, but is there sort of a one prevalent view or is it, again, trying to capture the uh, spectrum of opinions? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, we work with our movement partners to kind of figure out where we are on various issues as they come up. And we really want, you know, the reform rabbinate is a very big tent. Right. We have rabbis who have all sorts of different opinions about, as, as you alluded to before, but about what worship should look like and life cycle and their practice around keeping Shabbat and Kashrut and all of that. Right. And so I think in some ways, Israel and how we talk about Israel is another piece of that diversity that we have as a reform rabbinate. Amazing. Well, for just for our listeners to know, we are recording on a Friday afternoon, which I know is uh, <laughs> me, but our, our time is uh, is is limited. Um, so I wanted to thank you so much for coming and talking about, you know, what I think are the most important questions in modern American Jewish life. Um, before we let you go, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Anything I'm missing? Anything else about either your own work in Maine or CCAR that you would love to tell? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for having me on. This was really fun. I like a chance to to think about big ideas and and talk about them. And uh, you know, I'll just say I'm I'm so proud to be the president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. We have amazing Reform rabbis all over our country that are just doing incredible work every day. And it's really an honor and a privilege to to serve them and to help them as they lift up Reform Jewish values across this country and really connect people into into communities. And I think that's that's what we're all in it for, to create stronger Jewish communities, to to help people connect to their Judaism and, and to become more Jewish, whatever that looks like for them. So thank you so much for having me on. Amen. Well, thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you.